So this is it, the video that will finally tackle the most controversial, heavily debated choices in Witcher history. As we all know, Geralt of Rivia isn't your typical video game protagonist. Not laughing. He's not a blank slate or a new creation, he's a decades old character with thousands of pages of backstory and countless set in stone game moments that tell you exactly who he is and how he thinks. Despite that, the Witcher games will sometimes put you in control of how Geralt handles critical, often character-defining moral dilemmas. And while there's always an effort to make each option be believable for Geralt, at least before you look closely, what we're gonna do is look at the choices found within Hearts of Stone and try to answer the big question. What would Geralt actually choose to do in those situations without player influence tipping the scales? And in Hearts of Stone, from side quests to main quests, Almost every single one of those situations is a life or death scenario where the fate of another human being is in Geralt's hands. If I'd only known then how it would end. From Olgird to Iris to the Borsodi brothers to, if we're talking side quests, the Catskill Witcher Gaetan and the Cannibals of Oxenfurt. <sighs> Humans. Hearts of Stone just has nearly zero filler choices, and in my opinion, this expansion is CDPR's masterpiece. One that in terms of storytelling, they've yet to top. All of which is true. And it's also the birthplace of a silly little guy you might know as Gontaro Dim, so I'd say that alone makes it S-tier. Sniff it. Stroke it even. <laughs> By the way, I am aware that the Cat School Witcher side quest wasn't really part of Hearts of Stone. It came out as a free DLC before the actual expansion, but I just felt like I owed it to you guys to fit that choice somewhere in this series, because you supported the last video far beyond what I was expecting, and also, let's be real, CDPR were cooking with Witcher 3's post-launch choices, and I'd be an absolute buffoon to leave that one out. Sometimes, sometimes heads just roll. Anyway, the first real decision in Hearts of Stone doesn't actually come up until well into the expansion, but before we jump too far ahead, I do need to put emphasis on one thing. That being just how unbelievably full of shit Gontaro Dim is from the very beginning. Because this is an overlooked cloud that hangs over the entire expansion, and damn near every decision Geralt has to make during it. This some sick joke. In case you don't remember how things go, Geralt picks up Olgird's contract, then goes to him for details on what he thinks is a sewer toad monster. And soon after, Geralt ends up imprisoned and set to be executed because the toad was no toad. Olgird had duped him into killing an innocent man, an Ophiri prince named Servat. Without Gaunter's intervention, that very likely would have been the end of the White Wolf. But also, without Gaunter's intervention, Geralt never would have been imprisoned to begin with. What do I mean? Well, have you ever thought it was an extreme coincidence bordering on a plot hole that Geralt just happened to deliver the killing blow on the Toad Prince at the exact moment a search party from a faraway land arrived to save him? I mean, by the time Geralt gets involved, this prince had been a Toad for years, and for an expansion as tightly written as Hearts of Stone, that's a pretty lazy leap of convenience, isn't it? Well, no, because while Geralt doesn't yet know it, his ridiculously bad timing wasn't a coincidence, and the path that led him to a jail cell with his only means of escape requiring a debt to Gontaro Dim wasn't either. Throughout this video, as we build towards the Old Geared choice, which in my opinion is among the most complex in the entire series, my secondary goal is to set the record straight on both Gontor and Olgird, because I'll just be upfront here in saying that almost, if not every single video related to these two characters misses like half of their story and just gets a lot wrong, and it's the more interesting and important half that is often butchered. Gontor Odim is the reason Geralt found Olgird's contract in the first place. I mean, if you read the journal entry for Hearts of Stone's first quest, and by the way, the journal entries are written by Dandelion, recounting Geralt's adventures. It says, When Geralt later told me the story, which began at the Seven Cats in Notice Board, he mentioned that he had felt drawn to that place, as if some strange, undefined force wanted him to appear there on that day and at that time. I didn't give this remark a second thought until I heard the tale to its conclusion and realized its beginning had been no accident. If that doesn't convince you, well, there's more proof than just the journal entry, because if you look very closely in the cutscene where Geralt picks up Olgird's contract, for just the briefest of moments, you can spot Gaunter himself walking in the background, looking on as Geralt plays right into his hand. 
Geralt's debt to Gaunter was orchestrated by Gaunter every step of the way to that jail cell, because before Hearts of Stone even begins, he had already chosen Geralt as his best chance at collecting Olgird's soul, which, if you don't remember, required Gaunter to find a champion, a proxy, to complete three tasks of Olgird's choosing before his soul could be taken. I present to you my champion, Geralt of Rivia. I firmly believe, and this part is just my take because there's nothing specific to confirm it, but I've always thought that when Geralt first comes across Gaunter in White Orchard, at the very beginning of the base game, at which point Gaunter already knows everything about Geralt's life and gives him some information on Yennefer, I think even then, he had already picked Geralt out as his champion and was just waiting for the right opportunity to play his game the way he wanted to. Perhaps one day I'll be in trouble and you'll be nearby to help. Not that anyone thinks differently, at least I hope not, but Gaunter didn't help Geralt find Yennefer out of the pure, wholesome goodness of his blessed little heart. It was to plant that seed and to have some fun playing the modest, fair-minded merchant, something he does constantly despite nearly his every word being a very cleverly disguised half-truth. And as you'll see, that's part of his character that becomes darker and darker as Hearts of Stone's story progresses, and as Geralt is forced to take a stand in a few situations Gaunter's presence looms over. Speaking of, why don't I just give you what you're here for, the fates of Iris and Olgird von Eberek, two back-to-back -back choices that begin when Geralt arrives at Olgird's old estate. These are choices that, in a lot of ways, are not what they seem. And here on YouTube especially, woof, the story of Iris and Olgird is one that gets absolutely mangled left and right, and it makes me kinda sad because it's impossible to comment on what choice Geralt would make without understanding what horrible things Olgird is actually responsible for and what he really isn't but is often pinned on him, and also what Iris is truly going through in the state Geralt finds her in. Now, if you're about to say, hold up, you f bozo, you just skipped over Geralt's first two tasks for Olgird. Well, you're absolutely right if you were about to say that. I am a bozo, and for now, I did skip those quests, but here's why. After the shipwreck, the next five hours or so of Hearts of Stone might as well, for Geralt, be one big compilation of complete and utter bullshit, and despite how that sounds, I mean it as a positive. It's just that when Geralt is fulfilling Olgird's first two requests, Almost everyone he speaks to, other than Shani, of course, our beloved Shani, is either lying to him, half lying to him, or just doesn't know what the hell they're talking about when it comes to the true story of the Von Evereks and their involvement with Gontor Odim. It's only when Geralt arrives at Olgird's old estate that he can truly begin sifting through the lies. Quite the gripping story. Olgird's final meant to be impossible task for Geralt was for him to retrieve the rose he'd left his wife, Iris, on the day they last saw each other. In his search, Geralt runs into the small issue of discovering that, oh, the wife Olgird told me to speak to is a dusty, emaciated corpse, one whose spirit just tried to snuff him out in the hallway. And also, oh, in the afterlife, she's being served by weird cat and dog demons who speak in riddles, and also a stitched together monster that did his very best to bash Geralt's face in with a rusty shovel in the garden. When he spoke to Olgird, Geralt had thought the issue would simply be that the flower he wanted wouldn't exist anymore. It would have long crumbled, but Instead, that becomes the least of his worries. And what should be pointed out here is that even before things get really weird at Olgird's estate, Geralt is already in way over his head. I believe his what the hell is going on count is at five. What the hell? Who are you two? What the hell was that? What the fu- Even before he decides to bury Iris's remains, who then reappears and invites him into an alternate dimension of her own creation. The painted world. The work of Iris von Everek. It's in this world that Geralt has to decide whether to take the rose from Iris, ending her existence, or to leave it and her behind. Before he makes that decision though, he's forced to relive several of Iris's memories of Olgird, mostly her worst ones. And what needs to be known about these memories, if you want to understand Olgird and Iris as Geralt will, is that all of them, every single one, takes place after Olgird had already made his deal with Gaunter, which is what made their marriage possible. The quest is called Scenes from a Marriage, after all, not Scenes from Shortly Before a Marriage. Why is stressing when the memories take place so important? Well, because a critical, or arguably THE critical point of the expansion and of this quest, is that until one of the endings, Geralt never meets the real Olgird. Ever. People go on and on about his behavior towards Geralt and what a horrible husband Olgird was to Iris during the later flashback memories. I remembered learning to draw my husband's face. Yes, terribly. But what somehow gets completely overlooked, even in videos that claim to deeply analyze his character, 
is what this quest, Scenes from a Marriage, is trying to show you. What Geralt knows of Olgierd is what became of him AFTER Gontor Odim stole his humanity and turned his heart to stone. In fact, this is something that comes through so strongly that Geralt picks up on it the moment he spots a mere portrait of pre-Gontor Olgierd. Olgierd as I've never known him. A different man then. Now to be clear, I'm far from an Olgierd apologist, but this video isn't about me, it's about Geralt, which is why knowing what really happened and not what is often said happened is so important. As a Witcher fan, one thing you might have heard on Reddit or in a YouTube comment section is that Olgierd was always a horrible, irredeemable monster even before Gontor entered his life. But the truth is, there is no evidence of that in-game. None, unless we're working off a definition of monster that makes damn near every man in Skellige a hundred times worse than Olgierd ever was pre-Gontor, and it's what's in-game that matters because I don't think Geralt spends much time surfing Reddit. Almost all he ever hears about Olgierd pre-Iris pre-Master Mirror, and most of this comes from his brother, is that from the time they were still very young they were expected to go out on family raids. These raids, after Olgierd became the leader, and CDPR I think were extremely deliberate here so as to not make him irredeemable, are described multiple times. They'd ride into a village, storm the alderman's hut, brawl a bit with the men who objected, demand drink, and then pursue the village women who were interested in them, which, by the way, is mentioned like three separate times, I think on purpose, because that's the sort of thing that could very easily fall into now you're irredeemable territory. They'd then finish the raid by leaving with some loot. These were not Skellige-style raids of ride into town, kill every man possible, and do plenty of the other thing too, just for fun. They were more a couple of young local shitheads and their friends ride in and raise hell for an evening. You know, frighten the local peasants a bit, as Vladimir brags, which Gontor later taunts him for exaggerating about. Do their less bad raids make you, Geralt, or myself for that matter, sympathetic or able to relate to young Olgierd? No, believe it or not, I haven't stormed many aldermen's huts in my lifetime, and I'm not making the claim he was a good person or anyone to look up to, or even that he didn't end up in fights that ended with someone dead. I'm sure he was challenged and absolutely did, but Olgierd was hardly the irredeemable monster at birth he's often lazily made out to be, especially when we're looking at this world and the true evil that goes on in every corner of it. It's also worth mentioning that Hearts of Stone kinda bashes your head in establishing that Olgierd was always the odd one out in his family. He loved art and reading and had a code while on raids, which Geralt, if he doesn't act like a complete idiot, even sees in action the second time he meets the man. After the shipwreck, when Geralt returns to what he thinks is Olgierd's estate, you come across the place in flames and one of Olgierd's men in the yard about to be executed. Something I haven't seen mentioned often is that this man is the same one Geralt sees harassing some woman when he first visits the estate. <laughs> hey! Leave her be! Anyway, if, when you see this guy about to be executed, you don't immediately threaten to kill all of Olgierd's men, which I don't think Geralt would, the choice of saving him is ripped out of your hands, because Olgierd exits the burning manor, Geralt looks towards him, and while he's looking away... Well, we haven't a choice now. You find out, though, that this guy broke Olgierd's code. The estate really belonged not to Iris, but to the father of the woman I mentioned a minute ago. And the now headless man had killed the father in a fit of rage, completely of his own accord, and unbeknownst to Olgierd. So, Olgierd put the man to death for breaking the code he expected his current group to follow. And by the way, the group Geralt meets, the Wild Ones, are not his old crowd, at least for the most part because, as he tells you, they're a more wild group he picked up after leaving Iris, and they're a group that have cost him quite a bit of coin when they dabble in pyrotechnics, as he pays the owners back to make up for it. To back up though, Olgierd retaining his code for raids after he lost his heart is truly a perfect example of how airtight the character writing in Hearts of Stone really is. One of my favorite lines from the expansion comes up when Geralt is witnessing one of the final Iris memories, when Olgierd has completely lost touch with his humanity because it was something of a gradual process. By that point, their marriage has fallen apart entirely, and Iris recognizes that Olgierd is not even a shell of the person he once was, so she wants a divorce. It's this memory, though, where Olgierd pushes Iris's father, and that push ends up killing him. And after he commits that murder, the cat demon says something like, and then Olgierd fully ceased to be human, to which the dog replies, but he still loved his wife, which leads to this line. No, he merely remembered that he should love her. There is no better description of what the major catch his pact with Gaunter did to him than that. 
he still has his memories and at least in the early months of having a stone heart knows how he's supposed to feel but none of those feelings are actually there which even if you started out as a great person is extremely dangerous with that in mind though it makes complete sense that Olgird would still follow a specific set of set in stone rules once he returned to raiding after he left iris whereas navigating a marriage that's only failing because of an unspoken catch in his pact well that's a different story and it's here or maybe one or two minutes ago where i'll probably be getting some comments saying but old geard went to gaunter himself with no outside influence and well uh, of all people it's shani who provides Geralt the information that pieces that puzzle together but that comes after the Iris choice, because once Geralt has finished sifting through each of her worst memories, which she'd been forced to relive over and over again, he's able to temporarily reawaken the real Iris and speak to her. All she remembers is dying, quote unquote, and then years and years of torment through nightmares, because something that gets a little overlooked in this expansion is just how long has passed between the beginning of her and Olgird's marriage and Geralt coming into the picture. If you look in the journal, it explicitly says that many years have gone by since Olgird left Iris at the end of their marriage, and quite a while also passed during it. I mean, you can see their manner starting to fall into ruin even in the flashbacks. Anyway, speaking of time and passing, as Iris tells Geralt, who knows very little of what Olgird wished for at this point, one of Olgird's wishes to Gaunter was for both of them, not just him, to be immortal. Just like in Olgird's case though, Iris's immortality seems to have come with a major catch. If you don't remember, Iris just up and died after Olgird left her. As her servants put it, her heart burst, but because of Olgird's pact, she wasn't able to fully move on from the physical world. Instead, she was sent into a purgatory, at least partially of her own creation. This painted world between worlds, where her spirit was forced to relive her worst memories for all eternity. At least, all eternity until Geralt came along and recognized that her spirit had been bound to the Rose, leaving her in limbo, half attached to the real world she once lived in. Like an insect pinned in a collection case. Horrible. Geralt had never faced a case like this before, he says so himself, but he does heavily suspect that in taking the Rose, Iris will be able to move on. What exactly that means? Well, and what will happen then? Shall I be free of the suffering, the sadness? Is it the void that awaits? I don't know. Now, I have to be honest here, this is one of those choices that, for Geralt, would only ever go one way. For all my talk clearing up what's actually in the game about Olgird, the real, pure victim of Hearts of Stone is not him, it's Iris, who never did anything wrong. And Geralt being the one to enter her world for a moment is the one truly good thing Olgird managed to do for her after losing his heart, even if it wasn't on purpose. In all the ways that matter, Iris is dead. She exists only in a parallel world of torment, her body is a mound of dust buried in the dirt, and without Geralt's help, the best her future can hold are brief, confused moments of consciousness before her visitors leave and she drifts back to her nightmares, which, by the way, is exactly what happens if you don't take the rose. Well, I... I descend once more into my dream of what was. She is dead, and Geralt would help her move on. There's no resurrecting her in the Witcher world, your only options are necromancy and blood rituals, which, as Geralt says, is like... Choosing between pestilence and the plague. I think it says absolutely everything that if Geralt doesn't demand, but simply asks to take the rose and gives Iris a little time to think, she's able to make up her own mind and decides to give the rose up herself, even if she's a little scared. By the way, this outcome contains one of my favorite Geralt moments ever, because to take a short step back, right after Geralt buries Iris's body, before he enters the painted world, her servants tell him that one of her greatest fears in life was that no one would have anything nice to say about her after she was gone, and that she'd simply be forgotten. What does Geralt say to Iris just after she hands him the rose? I'll remember you, Iris von Everek. This expansion man, it's just perfect. Anyway, with the rose in hand, that means time is up for Olgird, and after one more visit to Shani that puts the last bit of his story together, that takes us to the choice of the expansion, and then we'll hit the two big side quests. And this is where we'll... Sega! As I was saying, this is where I give a quick thank you to Sega, which is definitely what you expected me to say, uh, as they made all the blood, sweat, and countless hours I've put into this video possible by sponsoring it so I could let you know about their newly released RPG, Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth, the latest installment in the Yakuza series that is currently getting universally rave reviews, and they've asked me to show you this quick trailer to get you hyped. Ah. 
Welcome to paradise. Aloha! <laughs> All right! I can show you around now. But there's a few things you need to learn before we have a good time. You can have a little fun with some friends. And even pick up a new skill. Whatever you do, be careful. Even Paradise can have his secrets. You trying to tell me there are Yakuza in Hawaii? Not exactly something you'd find in a guidebook, is it? Keep your friends close. And your enemies closer. Name's Dwight. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Take cover! Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth is available now on Xbox, Windows, PlayStation, and Steam. And for more information, just click my custom link in the description, which, by the way, really helps out the channel and helps me land future sponsors so I can afford to make videos like this. By the way, I do realize that trailer maybe seemed a little random. I was asked to show it, but... What I wasn't asked to do is to say this game is getting rave reviews, it just really is. And seriously, this game looks awesome from the combat to the minigames to the story. It takes place in Hawaii, which is pretty cool. So check it out if it seems up your alley. Anyway, remember a little earlier when I said Shani solves the final Old Geared puzzle? Well, I lied, because it's less that she solves it and more that she leads Geralt to the answers, which ultimately come from a sad elderly professor from the Oxenford Academy, one that Olgierd had been meeting with during his marriage in the hopes of finding a way to end his pact, which Geralt still doesn't know the details of even at this point in the story. Olgierd's meetings with this professor, by the way, are set up through the Iris memories. A really cool detail I only noticed recently, as Olgierd mentions fairly early on that he's planning to go to Oxenfurt soon. And that's right before Geralt finds out that Olgierd had exhausted every avenue he could think of, desperately trying to get in contact with Gaunter again, so he could give up his riches and immortality, as he wanted to end their pact and save his marriage. That is why he has the occultist books, because when he realized all the catches his pact held, he accepted the only way of saving his heart, marriage, and life was to get out of it, and it's when he ran out of ideas that he turned to this professor, who, as he tells Geralt, is... One of the foremost experts on the occult. Living experts, that is. What this guy is really here for, even though he does help with Olgier's story, is to tell Geralt, for a second time, how he can take down Gaunter, if he has the stones to try. I say a second time because if you take the rose from Iris, the cat and dog also give Geralt a pretty serious hint that will only make sense later. Seek salvation in glass that can't be broken. Glass that can't be broken? Now, I know, for whatever reason, there's kind of an obsession with giving Gaunter a specific label, devil, demon, god like his initial spell, which is one of those fun facts that's been repeated so many times it's just not very fun anymore. But ultimately, for Geralt's purposes, it's what this professor, Shakeslock, tells him that really matters. His research, which spanned years, took him across the continent, where he discovered a couple millennia's worth of documentation covering the havoc Gaunter had caused across cultures. People had given him every label you could think of and many names, but only one was consistent. Is my fair as spring as to water me draws you? Is tongue sharp and silvery as he implores you? You wish he grants as he swears to adore you. Evil Incarnate. Throughout history, his behavior was steady and, at its core, unchanging, as Gaunter was known mostly for one thing getting off on cruelly playing with his victims, enjoying their suffering. And more than any part of the process, he loved to offer up seemingly harmless little contracts that then allowed him to feel like he was playing sort of fair while derailing their lives before collecting their soul. I never cheat. It's all a big game to him, people are his playthings. Which might sound familiar if we flash back to the way he described Olgierd. He's a degenerate monster in human flesh who feeds on the pain and suffering of others. Master Mirror indeed, and it's honestly so fun to take a magnifying glass to those first couple of conversations Geralt has with Gaunter, on the ship and the one right after, because almost nothing he says early on is true once you know the full story. 
It's just that Gaunter is aware of what Geralt doesn't know, so he's having the time of his life twisting every single word under that context to make himself look like the victim. Just like everything he does, there's a self-serving purpose to that, and as Geralt himself says, Promise you this much, he never does anything simply, and certainly not on a whim. By playing the humble merchant in White Orchard and then the victimized savior of imprisoned Geralt when really he helped to put him in that spot to begin with, well, it allowed Gaunter to have even more of his second favorite thing after Human Souls. And that, my friends, is fun. Like spiking the soup of unsavory individuals with appropriately ghastly things. What the devil? It's so obvious in the best way throughout Hearts of Stone that Gaunter is absolutely loving, that he can savor the slow reveal to Geralt of his true nature, which wouldn't have been the case if he'd played more of his hand from the beginning. From mildly letting on that there's something a little more sinister to him when he procures a vial of Von Everek blood out of nowhere, to upping the ante after the wedding with Shani by torturing Vladimir's ghost, and only having this to say once Geralt says he absolutely didn't need to do that. Of course I needn't have. But I could. To his second most vile deed, at least second most that Geralt knows about, when he murders an old man with a wooden spoon to the eye, again, just because he was in a silly goofy mood and thought it would be fun. Gaunter is evil and loving it, and I think that's a big part of the reason we, as Witcher fans, love him as a character so much. Yeah, he's evil, but damn it if he isn't entertaining. Geralt, there are four dimensions. Length, width, height, and time. What would you have me fall in love with? Width? Come now. Now, Geralt, on the other hand, isn't quite like us in that way, mostly because for him, these things are actually happening in real life. You can see the look of pure disdain he has for Gaunter, even before he spoons the old man. You know what I mean. And also before Geralt talks to the professor, which is where the worst of Gaunter comes out. His past and what he specifically did to this other old man at the university. Just for doing research on him, Gaunter imprisoned the professor in what he called a protective circle, which is maybe the most easily understood example of how Gaunter twists the definition of words to the point where they're completely meaningless, because stepping outside of the protective circle just meant instant death, which ultimately is exactly what happens. <laughs> The worst he did to the professor though, even worse than death, comes from the man's journal which you can find on his body, where Shakeslock documents how Gaunter psychologically tortured him. He was your movie stereotype academic. This professor lived his life neck deep in his career, never started a family, and as an elderly man had some serious regrets. So after Gaunter imprisoned him, he started sending him visions of the ten year old daughter he never had. Visions so vivid they may as well have been real, leading Shakeslock to live for the sweet release of sleep as opposed to the nightmare of his daily imprisonment. Those visions lasted weeks until the daughter died, brutally, in his arms during one of them. That is Gaunter, as entertaining as he definitely is, the man's an absolute menace, one who gets enjoyment out of tormenting a sad old man. And anyone who says, oh, Gaunter is neutral, he only punishes people who don't word their wishes carefully. I mean, come on now. That's what Gaunter, who frames everything he does in the most dishonest way he can possibly get away with, wants people to think, yet when you look closely at his actions, they don't even come close to lining up to his words unless you're twisting them like a bottom feeder cartel lawyer. I mean, to begin with, Geralt's agreement is a complete joke even before you consider that Gaunter manipulated things to put him in that situation. Shakeslock didn't do anything at all, and if we want to talk blood and wine, Marlene, the spotted white Geralt can cure and then takes in as an old lady, well, just like in Geralt's case, Gaunter set her up. He posed as a beggar, went to her house in the countryside, and when she wouldn't take a random man into her home and feed him, he cursed her to a tortured existence where she was forced to watch herself slowly turn from a beautiful young woman to a feral monster, one that took many innocent lives, lives that are also on Gaunter's hands. By the way, if you're wondering what it is I'm talking about, Gaunter doesn't physically appear in Blood and Wine at any point, you can just find out that it was him who cursed this woman from Blood and Wine. Anyway, the funny thing is that, as of now, I think we'll see Gaunter again, but as of 2024, we don't actually have a single example of one of Gaunter's supposedly fair on the surface but deviously worded contracts, because the only situation we know of that could, could fit that bill is Olgierd's, which there's a reason I put this off until dead last. 
The details of Olgierd's rapid descent from a deeply in love rich young nobleman to him making a pact with Gaunter to fix his shattered life are scattered all across Hearts of Stone. They are everywhere for Geralt to find, in fact, hardly any two details are in the same place, and most are wildly out of order, up to and including a critical one from the talk with the professor, you know, before he bonks his head. Because of that scattered storytelling, though, a few crucial points are often, I'd argue, almost always overlooked. And the Toad Prince situation, the man Olgierd cursed for a reason we'll get to in a second, is part of the key. That is often thought of as a completely separate event that long predated Olgierd coming across Gontar, when really, those two things happened very, very, very close to one another. You can find a note from Olgierd to Iris in the attic of the Borsodi auction house, where Olgierd mentions that it's one week until Iris will be forced to marry the prince. One week. And he also mentions that he's hoping against hope that he can find the money to stop what caused her parents to promise Iris to that prince in the first place. In case you don't remember, what happened is Olgierd and Iris fell in love, her parents agreed they could marry, but when the Borsodi auction house acquired some debt the Von Everex had taken on and demanded it be repaid immediately, her parents then learned that all of Olgierd's possessions and his home were going to be seized to make up for that debt. So they instantly went out from underneath him and promised Iris' hand to a young Ophiri prince that had been studying at the Oxenfurt University, one that they had learned had taken a liking to Iris when they met earlier, and he wanted to take her away with him as his bride. The Borsodi auction house having Olgierd's note that mentions Iris had been promised to the prince really puts into perspective just how fast Olgierd's life fell apart, because the note being there means it's one of the items they seized from Olgierd's home. It even has a mention at the top listing the auction details and how it went unsold. For one, that shows the auction house heartlessly took everything Olgierd had down to a love letter, which they even tried to sell. But more importantly, as Olgierd tells you himself, the timeline from the Borsodis acquiring his debt to his possessions being auctioned off was mere days. And the journal explicitly says that Iris's parents only promised Iris to the Ophiri prince after the Borsodis acquired that debt. Olgierd mentions, and Vladimir separately corroborates, that the debt was a buildup of separate things over the course of years. A couple seasons of poor crops, a lawsuit, a poor investment. It was a tough but spread out enough situation that was nonetheless being managed, and it wasn't until Horst Borsodi went out of his way to acquire all of that debt at once that Olgierd ended up in real trouble. He tells you that after he learned of his debt being acquired, that he went to Horst and begged for just a bit of grace, because all he needed was a few weeks to sell some things and get the money together, but Horst refused him even that amount of time, so we're talking about, to be generous, and this is stretching it, let's say 10 days maximum. Between Horst acquiring Olgierd's debt, Iris's parents learning about it and near instantaneously offering her hand to another man, one who'd take her away to Ophir, and then Olgierd writing that note to Iris, which mentions both situations, and then Horst kicking Olgierd and Vladimir out of their family home and taking everything they owned that wasn't on their person, including said love letter. This expansion is called Hearts of Stone, plural for a reason, because that name doesn't just apply to Olgierd, as my god were both Horst Borsodi and Iris's parents ruthless, and they had no excuse. By the way, I realize I've probably received a million comments about this by now, that's okay, comments help videos, but I didn't forget about the Borsodi choice, where Geralt has to choose between siding with Horst or his brother Ewald during the heist when they enter the Borsodi vault to get something Olgierd requested. It's just that I'd put together a full section on that quest and just scrapped it because I realized everyone's gonna be clicking on this video excited to hear about Olgierd and Iris and Gaunter and Gaetan, and then because the heist is the real first choice in the expansion, I'd have to spend the first several minutes of the video talking about that instead, only to say what I will right now. I'm definitely not trying to say what you should have done or that anyone is wrong, but from Geralt's perspective, I don't think it makes any sense to side with Horst. Geralt spends days planning this heist with Yule. By the time they get to the vault, everything has fallen apart, Redanian soldiers are right behind them blocking the exit and trying to get in, and once they make it to the inner vault, Horst is already there and says in an act of desperation, uh, you and whichever companion Geralt chose, side with me and I won't let the Redanians touch you. The only other time Geralt has met Horst, he'd thrown him out of his auction house and tried to have him beaten after Geralt did nothing wrong whatsoever and said he'd leave willingly. Regardless of how things work out if you do side with Horst, 
why would Geralt put his faith in him? Not only faith to let him go and not rat him out on who he is to the Redanians later, but also to let him take the item he needs from the vault. The far less risky option is Yuld, who knows where the secret exit out of the vault is, and also can't rat on him to anyone else without screwing himself over too. The worst case scenario with Yuld is not bad at all, and it's what happens, in that, as it turns out, what Yuld wanted from the vault was the same thing Geralt needed. The house, quote-unquote, of Maximilian Borsodi, Horston Yuld's dead father. Yuld wants it as it contains papers that could destroy his claim to the auction house after Horst's death, and Geralt needs it because Olgier just vaguely said, Bring me the house of Maximilian Borsodi. Geralt then has to decide whether he kills Yuld to take everything for himself, or whether he offers up a compromise. Olgierd only mentioned the house. In fact, he made it seem like it was an actual house. We're currently without a roof over our heads. Perhaps we should start with that. So, a solution without further bloodshed is right there. Ewald takes the papers, Geralt takes the house itself, which I think is 100% the path forward, because Ewald, again, is the one who knows where the secret exit is. And does Geralt really want to risk getting stuck in this vault with a swarm of Redanians making their way in? I don't think so, and you know what else I don't think? That we're quite done with Olgierd, because the very, 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 I promise, last thing we haven't covered are the details of Olgierd's curses, the one he cast on the prince and the one cast on him by Gaunter. In that letter seized by Horst, Olgierd mentions that Iris is set to marry the prince in a week. Obviously, that didn't happen, so at some point within those seven days when Olgierd was forced into homelessness and Iris was just about to be married off, he screamed out the curse that turned the groom Iris desperately didn't want into a toad. Now, Olgierd claims two separate times that it was a curse I uttered in a moment of rage, with no thought to it actually taking hold. Whether you believe that or not is up to you, but Olgierd's claim is not a concept Geralt is new to. If you're familiar with the story of the Striga from the books and the pregame cutscene in Witcher 1 and even the show, sorry for reminding you it exists, but that's how Princess Ada was cursed into a Striga. It's an entirely different situation, but one of the lessons from that short story is, in the Witcher universe, words are powerful, and it doesn't take a mage to cast a curse when you combine charged words with the right emotions. And now to the matter at hand. As for how Olgierd met Gaunter, that is, yet again, one of those no end of that in your head. Well, I've said it too many times already. Geralt finds out from Shakeslock that after Olgierd became homeless, he and Iris just so happened to come across a wandering witch a wandering witch who had just one thing to tell them. She wanted to inform them about a goofy little fella named Gontaro Dim, who could grant any wish anyone could possibly come up with. Now, there is no concrete proof of this, but knowing what we do about Gontor, what are the chances that was a coincidence? Mere days after Olgierd becomes homeless and loses everything, he immediately runs into a witch who says, Hey, have you heard of this Gontaro Dim guy? I heard he's pretty swell and can fix every single problem you have. I suppose that could have just been one big, unhappy, cataclysmic coincidence, but, well, that just seems unlikely. It was then, though, the night after Olgierd watched all of his family heirlooms be auctioned off after being repossessed, that he went to a nearby inn, drank himself under a table, and then, in that state, he called upon the man the Wandering Witch had told him about. And this is where Geralt just doesn't know the details. He hears a little more during one of the endings if he gets to that point, but all the professor can tell him is that they met, and a deal was struck that would restore his fortune, allowing him to marry Iris at the cost of his brother. How it was worded, we don't know. Whether Gaunter straight up said, your brother will die if you agree to this, we also don't know, but that is ultimately what happened, as Vladimir indirectly died the next day. He mentions himself that he tried his customary storming of an alderman's hut to demand drink, but they weren't having it. He tried to hide in the cellar, but they killed him anyway. And this is where Shakeslock tells Geralt how he can defeat Gaunter, and I want to focus on a few crucial points. First is that, without any player input, defeating Gaunter is instantaneously where Geralt's mind goes. Oh, no way to get rid of him? Shakeslock then tells him that to save Olgierd's soul, his only option would be to do what the professor had heard of a man successfully accomplishing in the past, challenging Gaunter to a duel of wits. Challenge him to such a duel. He'll agree and can be beaten. The catch, Geralt would have to put his own soul on the line. And again, I think it's very important to point out that after being told what the stake would be, this is what Geralt asks. If I challenge him and the pact that way, will it go away? 
to me, this clearly says Geralt is already at least thinking about the possibility of challenging Gaunter if the situation calls for it, and call for it it does, as after the professor bonks his head, uh, Geralt goes to the meeting point and arrives first. I want to stress that by this point, we know Olgird's past about five times better than Geralt does. He has every bit of information I've covered, except for the odd moment here or there, like the mention of the Blood and Wine quest, but I cannot begin to tell you how much I have agonized over putting everything together for this video in a somewhat coherent way, because Geralt just gets fragments completely out of order and has no time to stop and piece anything together. What's important, though, is that when Geralt arrives first at the meeting point, everything he's learned since the last time he met Olgird has fleshed out the man from the lowlife Geralt clearly doesn't think much of early on to a far more complex man that may not be a perfect one or anything close to perfect, but certainly has a lot more to him than just being a heartless shell of a man, as a heartless shell couldn't possibly write a letter that would lead to Geralt making this comment. It was true love. Keep in mind, the last time Geralt talked to Olgird was before he'd even visited Iris, and before he'd learned that Gaunter had cursed Olgird's heart to stone as yet another hidden side effect in one of his packs. I really think the number one question Geralt would have for Olgird going into this meeting would be, so what exactly does having a heart of stone feel like? What has been done to you? Because that's the question that contextualizes so, so much of Olgird's past. I feel nothing. The bad things he's done, from putting up that toad contract to sitting idly by as his companions burn down buildings. That's something I feel confident about, that Geralt would have some questions for this human being who, like him, had been played with by Gaunter. I mean, even prior to the spooning and the horrifying details the professor's story provided, one of the last interactions Geralt and Gaunter have is him pulling yet another epic classic Gaunter move with Geralt's agreement, which was already a joke to begin with. He says, oh, I mentioned in passing during a later conversation that we'd all meet and thank one another for the journey shared, so what that means is you have to do yet another thing for me and bring us all together before I'll undisfigure you, which was yet another element of Geralt's agreement with Gaunter that was never mentioned, and you can tell at that point Geralt is so fed up. End quote. Mm, yeah, I remember. Anyway, unfortunately Geralt doesn't get a chance to have any sort of meaningful conversation with Olgird about all that he's learned, because when he shows up, Geralt gives him the rose, at which point Olgird reflects for a moment. Iris, what a mess we made of it all. If I'd only known then how it would end. And then, immediately, Gaunter arrives from the sky and reveals that yet again, he duped both Geralt and Olgird. Geralt, into helping him further along to collect a human being's soul, something he'd never do knowingly, and Olgird into the way Geralt had done that, as the meeting point Gaunter demanded was the moon, sort of, as part of Olgird's agreement with Gaunter was that after the tasks were completed, his soul could only be collected on the moon, and this is the part of the quest that's more or less a one-to-one -one takeaway from the legend much of Hearts of Stone is inspired by, Pan Twardowski, who thought he could outsmart the devil by making his soul only claimable in Rome, only for him to unknowingly be tricked into entering a tavern called Rome. And then, on the way to hell, he prayed and managed to be dropped on the moon, which CDPR instead used as the trick meeting point. Anyway, Gaunter then immediately goes for Olgird's soul. You're given a timed choice for Geralt, whether to intervene or not, and, I mean, I've played my hand by this point. You know, I went into this video thinking I'd have to cop out in some way for this choice, a first for this series, because I thought of it as such a tough, tough, tough choice, but the more I examined every corner of Hearts of Stone, and the more I looked at the way this meeting comes about, and all that Geralt learns before ever getting a chance to speak to Olgird again, the more I became convinced that Geralt would not be able to help himself, that he wouldn't be able to stand idly by and watch this human being have his soul taken, where he'd be gored and tormented until the end of time. I completely agree, by the way, that Geralt just stepping back and watching this happen would be the logical choice, but I don't think not being able to watch Gontra consume a human soul is him acting with logic, it's him acting with his heart. And just because the expansion is called Hearts of Stone doesn't mean Geralt needs to have one in the end. So, this isn't where things end, because we still have the cat school and cannibal choices to cover, but if you were mostly interested in the main story, I just wanted to say thanks for watching, thank you to my patrons who make this kind of content even possible, and if you're wondering whether I'll be covering Blood and Wine, the answer is… probably. 
If this video is met with the same reaction the other two were, I do plan to make that happen, I want to make that happen. And hey, if you want to see more, consider leaving a like, as that's how YouTube decides whether videos are worthy of being shown to anyone, which is stupid, but whatever, I don't make the rules. And feel free to subscribe if you want to see more from this channel. Anyway, let's start with the cannibal quest, because this one is pretty simple. It just has an interesting choice. This Witcher contract comes from the heist halfling, Otto, the one who hides Yuld Borsodi in his basement while he plans his auction house takeover scheme. Anyway, Otto's apprentice, also a halfling, has gone missing in a somewhat nearby forest, and... Well, actually, that's it. I said it was simple, didn't I? You got to think on that. When Geralt arrives to where the apprentice went missing, he discovers the halfling's cart in ruins, and a trail of blood that soon runs cold in a nearby, mostly abandoned village. If he snoops around a bit, Geralt can discover a large number of months-old bloodstains from a clearly separate incident in a cabin next door to the only humans left in the village, who, when spoken with, claim the place is otherwise empty because... Young folk have gone off to the city seeking work, and the old have all died. It's pretty hard to believe no one wants to live in this village right next to a water source, and within walking distance of several other small, thriving communities. If asked about the blood in the hut, the old lady claims her husband got game in there, which, for now, let's just say is interesting. When Geralt tells them why he's really there, the apprentice he's looking for, all the old lady has to say is, I saw a little one round here. Out picking herbs. It's only when Geralt pushes the subject by mentioning the blood trail that led directly to them that she offers up more of a story. That the halfling supposedly had been attacked by wolves and ran to them seeking shelter. And because she and Judd are such helpful heroes, they told him to go home before something worse happened, but he insisted on going back out, at which point they heard him die. Even here, their story is already stretching believability, and as Geralt says, if the halfling had been torn apart by wolves in the woods, surely there would have been a sign. Wolves would have left something. His boots, maybe. To this, Judd, that prankster, we love him, classic Judd. Talk to the wife. He claims that he doesn't know where the halfling's remains are, because they're just a humble old couple, too elderly, decrepit, and in their life alert era to possibly go out in the woods that are 15 yards away. Really, Judd? Really? Right as rain. Didn't your wife just say that you regularly hunt and gut game in the cabin next door? At this point, the quest log will just tell you to go back to Otto, but there's obviously more to this story, and with a little more look, eh, I mean smelling, the investigation continues. This smell leads to an underground and heavily stocked meat cellar that was well hidden. And while there's a wide variety of options for any taste palette, Geralt zeroes in on one rare cut in particular. Light-haired halfling. Must be full cut. Ripped open, gutted, and drained. No way to determine the cause of death. This cellar is also filled with a dog and two human-sized cages, including one that still has the skeletal remains of another former victim inside. When confronted, the old couple claim they don't kill, they just gobble up the remains of wolf victims, because otherwise they'd go hungry. Really? So why the cages with the victims still inside of it? And why are wolves leaving that much meat on the bone? And how is eating already picked apart wandering halflings and humans their only option when their meat cellar is stocked and wildlife is teeming in every corner of their village and its immediate surroundings? Also, looking back, why were there months-old bloodstains in the cabin where they supposedly gut game when they have a clearly not new cellar where that work is obviously done? And why, on the subject of the bloodstains, is their village that's right next to a water source and prime hunting grounds empty, even though there are perfectly good cabins all around? These two are clearly lying. Nothing they have to say adds up. And this choice, whether Geralt just kills them or makes them promise to stop eating human flesh, is... Well, neither outcome is perfect, in my opinion, and I kind of wish you could just turn them in, though maybe the idea is that Geralt thinks handing them into the Redanians would be more cruel than putting them down, but ultimately, these two are monsters. If we're talking about a Geralt who discovered all the evidence, including the cages and the other human remains, not even to mention the halfling, the reason he's there, then just walking away here and promising to come back at some point is borderline unhinged, I mean, Geralt would be actively putting future innocents at risk in that scenario. The most Geralt way available of handling this situation, in my opinion, is to threaten to kill them and then get more of the truth out, because that's something you can do. If Geralt tells the couple he's gonna kill them, 
For one, they attack with such vigor and stamina that you can immediately throw out any past claim of frailty, but if you're patient and if you don't just cut them down instantaneously, what they have to say mid-battle really drives the nail in on what they've been doing to people. Gonna slurp your oysters! Oh, gobble your liver! Chop you up! Stick you in a shoe! At that point, putting these monsters down is fully justifiable, at least more so than just letting them be where they could kill more innocent people. Otto's apprentice has been avenged in this scenario, and hopefully, hopefully, that village can be reclaimed by, you know, non-serial killer cannibals. For the record, there are little bits and pieces of further confirmation post-quest, nothing really new, just more of the same, but the most important bit is that if you pick up the couple's cabin key off of their bodies, you can enter their home and see that, yep, no surprise, they're living like kings and have a very well-stocked home. You're not human, that's clear. So we may as well end this video on a really controversial one, the Gaiatan choice. And by the way, I've been saying his name like that because even though every YouTube video ever calls him Gay Tan, well, his name is said out loud once in game, just not during the quest itself, and it's said like this. What was his name? Gaia Tan? So I'm gonna go with the game there, forgive me, and by the way, there's a really nice little direct Hearts of Stone connection there, because to back up, if you buy the painting from someone called Van Ro during the auction quest, you can later discover during the heist that Van Roe was Iris's pseudonym for her paintings, and by traveling to Novigrad's town square, more specifically the bookshop there, you'll find that Iris's work now has a dedicated collector, another nice way that she wasn't forgotten. Anyway, in addition to payment if you choose to sell her painting, the bookkeeper also gives you a monster trophy that Gaetan had apparently left there as collateral years ago, but never reclaimed. That's so interesting. Thanks. Now, Gaetan's quest is one that I don't really think needs much of an introduction, as it's one of two Witcher contract moments where Geralt has to decide the fate of another Witcher. The other, of course, being Yad Karadin from Novigrad, a base game Witcher contract choice that I just covered in a little bonus video on the Patreon because I couldn't fit it into the base game video. Anyway, for Gaetan, a contract leads Geralt to a village where a massacre had taken place. While the contract mentioned a monster, a real one, Something else, something human, had killed the villagers, and after disposing of the ghouls that had arrived to feast on the bodies, Geralt immediately picks up on the nature of what had happened there. Not a living soul in sight. Something evil's been here. Necrophages appeared after. What's to be found in the village? While a fight had obviously taken place in the barn involving two men and a third party who'd killed them and escaped, everyone else in this village of Honorton, including their pets, had been cut down afterwards, mercilessly, as Geralt notes that each and every one, several men and multiple women, had been minding their own business and hadn't fought back when killed. Died without a fight. Butchered. He died quickly. Didn't put up a fight. Blade pierced her back between vertebrae. Severed her spinal cord. She couldn't move. Bled to death. As it turns out, there was just one survivor, a young girl, who confirms Geralt's suspicions. It was another witcher who'd massacred the village, and she also tells him that he'd cut down both her mother and brother, but that she does have an aunt who lives nearby. I'll take you to her, but first I gotta see to this bad man. Now Geralt can choose to kill Gaetan immediately after finding him, or to hear him out. I wanna chat first, then we'll see. This choice, I think, is obvious. Geralt would want to know what happened regardless of what's to come. As Gaetan tells you, he'd arrived there for the same contract Geralt had, and after killing the monster, the Alderman tried to stiff him. Instead of their agreed rate, he offered 12 crowns, an insultingly low number, which is something witchers aren't unfamiliar with. As Geralt points out, though, that doesn't explain the massacre. Rings a bell, but that's no reason to kill. He then tells you the rest of his story. When he refused the twelve crowns and insisted on more, the alderman, who for Velen standards clearly had the money, told him that they had some extra coin hidden in the barn. Gaetan bought that story, even though it seems like an obvious trap to me, but the two of them and the alderman's right-hand man then went into the barn, where very predictably, while the cat school witcher was looking towards one, the other stabbed him with a pitchfork. Reasonably, Gaetan then killed them both. Unreasonably, he then decided to kill every innocent man, woman, and pet in the village, with the only survivor being a young girl he spared because she apparently reminded him of a sister he once had. What a nice guy. That was sarcasm, by the way, and Geralt himself heavily suspects that this massacre wasn't Gaetan's first. Got carried away. Not the first time, either. 
Right. Listen, the choice of this quest in your playthrough is of course completely up to you. My opinion means nothing when it comes to how you view this situation, but this video is what would Geralt do, and I'd be a complete idiot and would have failed every single one of you rendering this entire video pointless if I were to look at this choice and not bring up the near one-to-one -one scenario, near because it was less bad, not more, that Geralt had already faced with a violent cat school witcher in the past. Don't worry about spoilers here, but something some might not realize about the books is that in them, there are only two instances total where Geralt interacts with other witchers. One, when he's at Kaer Morhen training Ciri with Vesemir and the others of the Wolf School, and two, when he comes across a cat school witcher named Brienne in an inn during Season of Storms. Like Gaetan, Geralt had never met Brienne before, though unlike Gaetan, Geralt knew who Brienne was, as all other witchers had shunned him, even other cat school witchers who are known for their tempers, because he had cut down some innocents in the village of Yalo after they provoked him. Sound familiar? Anyway, in the space of about three pages, Geralt threatens to kill Brienne about five different times for two different reasons. Why? Well, first, because Brienne threatens to hurt or kill one priestess. Geralt then tells him several separate times that if this priestess is harmed in any way, Brienne won't leave the inn alive. For the record, the whole witchers don't fight other witchers thing, just like almost every witcher quote that gets constantly misused, well, that's an ideal, and that's it. It's an ideal that goes out the window when witchers are killing innocents, as their entire purpose, what they are trained to do from birth, is to protect the innocent from monsters. Hell, in the book, Brienne had heard that Vesemir had put a contract out on his head after hearing about what he had done, and while that supposedly wasn't true in the end, it says a lot that that was even a thought in his mind, a possibility. Anyway, that's not the end of the story, though, because when Brienne is on his way out of the inn, he eventually goes peacefully, Geralt tells him that if he ever hears of Brienne killing again, innocence that is, that he'll happily go out of his way to track him down and put him in the ground. And that's not an empty threat. It's Geralt saying he will hunt Brienne down if he even hears of another incident, let alone sees the immediate fallout of one only to face the Witcher who did it a minute later. And of course, I'm talking about Gaetan at this point. Now, of course, this does not have to change how you feel about Gaetan. Everyone has to draw their own line for this world, but for the purpose of this video and Geralt's character, I just want to be upfront here and say that the sparing Gaetan option was not handled very well, in my opinion. I do think, as a concept, that walking away is a believable path forward for Geralt, because when push comes to shove, this isn't where I lean, but I could see him not being able to bring himself to cut down another Witcher when there are so few remaining. It falls at least into the spectrum of believable options. Execution-wise, though, this outcome should have been handled in a similar way to how Geralt dealt with Brayan, or a combination of that situation and how he handles Letho when you spare him at the end of Witcher 2, meaning Geralt is disgusted but, in the end, doesn't do it. That I could accept, and it would make this decision much more 50-50 in my mind. What's very awkward, though, is this. They call me the Butcher of Blaviken, for good reason. I know how it is. Sometimes, sometimes heads just roll. I don't even know where to start here. Geralt relating to Gaetan if you spare him, sympathizing with him and saying, I know how it is, after he slaughtered innocent men and women. Ten seconds earlier. So you decided to massacre the whole village. I mean, that's rough already, and there is no moment you can point to where Geralt knowingly killed innocent people just because he was throwing a fit. And on that note, whoever's idea it was to have him call back to Blaviken and his nickname here? Well, Witcher 3 is a huge game, my favorite of all time, but I don't think this was thought through very well. Geralt's nickname from Blaviken and how he got it is not even remotely comparable to what Gaetan did, and I don't think Geralt would ever make that comparison. He's known as the Butcher of Blaviken because a crowd of innocent people didn't have the information to understand what Geralt had done for them. Geralt had learned that Renfri, a character you might be familiar with, and her men were intending to kill every single civilian in a marketplace to draw a wizard, Stregobor, out of his tower. When Geralt gets to the marketplace, he takes all of them head on, other than Renfri who isn't there quite yet. From the peasant's point of view, he was just killing indiscriminately, when from Geralt's, he was doing the best he could with the information he had to save their lives. He wasn't going into the houses of innocent women, cutting them down and killing their dogs. Don't get me wrong, I don't want to completely derail the video, so I'm not going to get into it, but if you're familiar with that story of Blaviken, 
there is a really thought-provoking layer of potential moral grayness to it. You killed her, didn't you? Had no choice. Ultimately, Geralt was trying his best to save lives, and because in this video we're discussing Witcher 3, Geralt, I mean, spoiler alert for the books, although this is kind of the entire premise of the games, it's mentioned about 500 times, so hard to miss, but you've been warned. Game Geralt is a man who died trying to protect innocence. He lived on because his daughter is who she is, but he put his life on the line, and in all the ways that matter, paid with it to protect innocent lives, and now he's going to sympathize with the type of man he'd have had to defend them from in that moment? I don't think so, and even if he is a fellow Witcher, I really think the spare option should have been much less, I get you, and much more, get out of my sight. That's just my take though, ultimately of the two options, because one I feel was not handled very well character-wise, I would take Geralt just putting an end to him any day. Anyway, that is all for today. If you enjoyed, please consider leaving a like and subscribing for more. Look forward to blood and wine in the future. Follow me on Twitter for updates. Check out the Patreon if interested. And I guess that's all. See ya.